In this video lecture, we're going to continue our study of argumentative analysis, which, to remind you, is the process of identifying arguments and breaking them down into their component parts. In the last lecture, we began studying diagramming arguments, which, as you know by now, is a process of visually displaying how the parts of an argument fit together and lead to a particular conclusion. There we studied whether or not our, uh, premises are dependent or independent, and we showed how we can represent this relationship between these premises. Today we're going to study something different, which is the process known as distilling arguments. This is going to begin a lecture series that's in three parts. Today we'll just begin and study part of the process of how to distill an argument. Now another language can be a little bit confusing, diagramming, distilling, uh, but at these concepts or these methods are very very different. So what is it to distill an argument? Well in a word to distill an argument is to if my computer will change screens there we go to identify isolate and extract the main thrust of an argument from a text. Most of the time when we encounter arguments they're not presented in a nice neat package for us. Instead They'll be presented over the course, if you're lucky, maybe just a paragraph, but most of the time it's going to be over the course of an entire essay, maybe a newspaper article that's you know several pages long, uh, maybe an essay that's 10 to 20 pages long, or, or maybe even an entire book. But not all of the information that an author presents is always absolutely necessary. In fact, you'll find that the vast majority of it is not essential to the main thrust uh, or the essence of the argument. Uh, what we want to do is to be able to identify, okay, exactly what is the conclusion you want to draw and exactly what are the key premises needed to establish that conclusion. Most of the time an author will not only give you the main points they use to establish a conclusion or the main premises, I should say, but they'll provide examples to illustrate a premise or maybe examples or additional information to help clarify or explain a premise or maybe examples for the conclusion or clarificatory remarks about the conclusion. But we don't need all of that when we're trying to distill, distill the argument. We just want to break it down. Okay, what exactly is absolutely necessary to get me from A to B here? Now, when we talk about distilling arguments, some of you might be familiar with the word distilling from uh, you know distilled alcohol, distilled spirits, or whiskey. Uh, you see I have my moonshiner here, uh, and when we talk about distilling alcohol, uh, typically, for those who don't know, when you make, let's say, whiskey, you start with a huge concoction of like, I forget exactly how it's made, but it's like barley and water and a bunch of other mess, and it's in the concoction you start with, it, I think it's called a mash, and I don't know exactly how much is contained in it, but it could be, a, you know, gallons upon gallons of, of this, and what you do is you boil this down and then you boil it down you can see here these little coils uh, it'll um, uh, create vapors they'll pass through these coils and what comes out at the end is a small isolated concentration of alcohol which is this is how you get you know like I don't know a hundred proof alcohol or whatever you you distill the, the spirits you basically you know reduce it or boil it down to just the key essential uh, ingredients and you might start with, you know, like let's say five gallons of this mash and you'll end up with like, you know, a, I don't know, like a liter, maybe not even a liter, maybe half a liter of actual distilled whiskey. And I'm using that as uh, an illustration or metaphor for, you know, something we're doing here with respect to arguments, which is you start with this huge concoction of, I don't want to say concoction, but this large text. And then you basically want to boil it down to just the key ingredients that are absolutely necessary at the end. And this is also a helpful way to re remind you about distinguishing uh, diagramming versus distilling. You know, you, you talk about distilling alcohol, but you don't talk about diagramming alcohol. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, distilling, you break it down to its component parts. Same thing for arguments. Now, let me give you an example because this is all really abstract here. And this is uh, a rather lengthy, it was actually a newspaper article, but I want you to read through this. I want you to pause the video lecture and read through this and try to figure out what is the main argument being presented here. I want you to not just figure out what is the conclusion, but I want you to figure out what is the argument, what are the premises that are absolutely necessary for establishing the main conclusion. Take a second, pause the video lecture, and figure that out, and we'll come right back. And I'll try to 
share with you what I think the argument is here. Well, hopefully you did pause the video lecture and you tried to figure out the argument for yourself. It's really important that you do that, that you not just skip over it and just go to what I'm going to tell you because this is something you're going to have to learn and you are going to be tested on. But let's assume uh, in the spirit of charity that you did what I asked. Uh, what is the argument being presented here? Now, you might have read through this and thought, what the hell is going on here? I mean, the person seems to be bouncing all over the place. You know, they make points, they come back to points. They never really, you know, fully state, it seems like, what their conclusion is. They, they dance around the issue a little bit. And when we talk about distilling arguments, I want to say at the outset that what we're trying to do is basically offer a, a brief summary of the argument. And we have to do a little bit of detective work a lot of times. Uh, and, and when we distill arguments, it is open to some uh, in, you know, difference of interpretation. Now, there's certainly you know, wrong interpretations of, a, of an argument. Uh, you know, in this one, if, if I conclude it, I don't know. I said, well, I think what this person is trying to show is that um, parents should um, listen to professionals and parents um, don't know how to raise their kids apart from professional help. Uh, you would have completely misread what this person is saying. You would just you would not understand what they had said. Um, that would be wrong. But you know there is a range of acceptable interpretations as to what's going on here. And I'm going to offer one. I'm not saying this is the definitive perfect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, summary of the argument, but this is, I think, a reasonable reconstruction of it. And the first thing you have to do is figure out what the person is even trying to conclude. And I think what they're trying to conclude, in a word, is that basically um, professionals um, should stay out of the, leave parents alone, and let parents um, make decisions for their children um, without, you know, professional interference. Well, why exactly? Um, uh, how does the person argue for this? Well, th in a word, because they want to say that uh, these professionals are doing more harm than good. Well, how are they doing more harm than good? Well, basically, the, the professionals are creating stress and distress in families, making parents question themselves. Because they're making parents question themselves, they're doing more harm than good. So therefore, uh, um, professionals should stay out of the business of parenting and let parents be parents and make decisions all to their own. You know, self. Uh, so that's in a in a sense um, part of the argument. Now we can reproduce this and state it a little more formally in the following way: um, Professionals have made parents mistrust themselves and their own judgment about their uh, children, and their uh, professionals have brought stress and distress to many families. Thus, professionals have probably brought about an increase in the incident of child abuse. You actually saw that in the second and third paragraphs. Um, hence, professionals do more harm than good, and so therefore, professionals should allow parents to make their own judgment about what is best for their children. And this is a reconstruction of the argument. What I've done is I have distilled it, and I want you to look at this, and then go back a slide, and look at all this. I mean, there's so much information about, you know, you see um, numbers being thrown around here, uh, you, know, you see the person begins with, you know, a quotation, uh, and it's just not all of it is necessary to state what the argument is, the, the essence of the argument. We can break it down in just this way. And this right here, what you see in front of you, is much more clear, much more to the point than what you saw on the previous slide. Not only that, as a second point I want to emphasize here, is notice how the argument beats around right here. I mean, the opening way I've distilled it, um, you know, this comes right here, the first premise from the fifth paragraph. This right here, which is a conclusion, actually comes from the second and third, which is before this, and is also before um, uh, the second premise. And then here, the conclusions uh, that we're drawing, actually we have, notice we have three conclusions, thus, hence, therefore. Um, the conclusions, um, four, like at least four and five, I mean, I don't know that they're ever, you know, explicitly stated. I mean, we, we had to do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, detective work to kind of piece those together. But I think this is a reasonable interpretation of what is going on here. And not only does this enable us to understand the person a little more straightforwardly, but it also, if we were to disagree with them, we could say, all right, well, here's where I disagree with you. Um, 
you know, your premise one, I don't agree with, or I don't agree with premise two, or I think, you know, the move from two to three is not a good move. Um, I don't think that that, that three follows from two, uh, or three seems maybe a little bit um, premature. Uh, so you, you could see here, not only can we display the argument as to what's going on, we can see the train of thought more clearly, but we have a means of discussing uh, and evaluating the argument in, in a more streamlined fashion. Now, this is um, the process of distilling an argument. You know, in the last video lecture, we talked about diagramming it. Uh, I wonder if you could figure out how to diagram this argument based on what you see up here. And I think this would be a, a good place also for maybe you to stop for a second, pause the video lecture, and think, how would you diagram this? So just go ahead and do that. Pause it and diagram this argument. Well, again, I hope you actually did that, uh, but here's how I think you would diagram this argument, just like this. Uh, not not uh, the most uh, elaborate diagram, but I do think that you know it just follows this nice, neat sequence here. Professionals have made parents um, mistrust themselves, hence professionals. So I said we had three conclusions. We actually have four. Hence, professionals have brought distress. Therefore, professionals have probably brought about an increase of child abuse. Therefore, you know, professionals do more harm than good. Therefore, professionals um, should allow parents to make their own judgments. So, um, and, and hopefully you see here as well, you know, we look at what I have over here on the left, all of uh, this information, um, my cursor will come up, all of this, I mean, this tells us certain information, this way of presenting the argument. This also tells us, you know, a different set of information. I mean, looking at one, two, and three, I don't know what the content of one, two, and three are, but I can see the overall structure of the argument. One leads to two, two to three, two to four, two to five. Whereas over here, I don't get a sense so much of the structure of the argument, but I do get a sense of the content of the argument. So both ways of presenting arguments, as I've done it over here, is it offers some sort of information. This also offers a different set of information. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit more about this. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but this is known as putting an argument in premise conclusion form. This is known as diagramming the argument. The process of distilling it more generally is just breaking down the argument to its essential ingredients. Now, what we're going to do in this lecture and in the next two, in fact, is we're going to hone our skills for distilling arguments. And I'm going to present five different steps that you need to follow whenever you try to distill an argument. And the first step is just to determine whether our um, passage contains an argument at all. We talked about this in a couple of classes ago when we talked about uh, the difference between arguments and explanations and assertions. So we've already covered this and I'm not going to spend much time on it today or in the next few lectures. Then once we figured out we are dealing with an argument, step number two, we identify uh, the conclusion of the argument. Then we identify the premises. Then we put the argument into premise conclusion form. And finally, we apply what is called the principle of charity. Now I'm going to go through each one of these steps, except for one. I'm going to go through each one and talk about them. In this lecture, we're only going to cover steps two and three. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about four and five. Um, I, want, I don't want to give you the impression, though, that you know you, this process of distilling an argument is this nice, neat, linear uh, form where you do, you do one, you do two, you do three, you do four, you do five. The reality is, is there's back and forth between all of these. Um, it doesn't always necessarily follow this nice, neat um, sequence. So I'm just presenting these sequentially because that's the easiest way to, to discuss it and talk about it. Um, but just know at the outset, whenever we're distilling an argument, sometimes you'll start with, you'll identify the conclusion, then you'll, you'll go and you'll try to figure out the premises, but you realize, oh wait, based on these premises, I don't think that what I thought initially was the conclusion actually is. Maybe they were trying to establish a different conclusion. So there is some back and forth uh, motion here. But we're going to begin by talking about identifying the conclusion. And as far as this goes, you know, I just, I'm about to tell you contradictory things, but I said this isn't a nice, neat, uh, you know, sequential process. But I do think whenever you're distilling an argument, once you've identified that it is an argument, uh, identifying the conclusion is probably your best, um, uh, best bet or your best first step. And the reason I say that is because, number one, identifying the conclusion is often the easiest thing to do. Uh, 
whenever someone presents an argument, they, they, they don't want to typically hide the conclusion. Sometimes that does occur. But typically, they, they want to advertise their conclusion as strongly as possible. And they oftentimes, um, more so than with premises, do use those indicator words like therefore, ergo, thus, hence, consequently. This shows that we can conclude that. Um, you know, they'll use these indicator words and they'll just tip you off. Hey, this is the conclusion right here. So number one, I would say, when, whenever we're trying to distill an argument, look for the conclusion just because uh, most of the time it's the easiest thing to identify. Um, but secondly, and there's a, more, there's a deeper reason, is that when we identify the conclusion, that basically determines how we're going to interpret all the rest of the argument. Um, you know, sometimes you'll read an argument and the person will start off presenting you know, premises but they're doing it merely for the sake of, of, of argument. They're like, well, here are some premises. And, and it's only later that you realize, like, oh, they didn't believe any of that. They were just you know, presenting the other side of the coin in order to dismantle what, what their opponent was saying. Um, that's why I think it's always vital just to, all right, what, are you, what is this person trying to establish? Let's figure that out, what their conclusion is. And then you can go back and reconstruct the rest of the argument. Um, Knowing the conclusion basically enables you to, to kind of have like a hook that you can hang everything else they're saying on. And this is why whenever I read like lengthy essays or a newspaper article, um, I look for, I skim through it and try to find the conclusion first. You know, when you're, when you're reading an argumentative essay, you don't read it the same way you would read like a murder mystery where you're trying to save, you know, the climax to the very end. When you're reading an argumentative essay, you want to know what the conclusion is up front. Uh, I always find it extremely frustrating when the person, uh, you're just making arguments and you're like, where is this going? What does this lead to? I don't know. You want to know your destination before you know how to get there. I mean, imagine someone's giving you directions to a location and you don't even know where you're going. It's going to be very frustrating. It's like, all right, you're telling me how to get to Bakersville, California. Well, tell me that's where I'm going first and then tell me how to get there. Don't just start, well, you get on uh, you know, I-40 West and you go, you know, it's like, all right, well, where are you, where are you leading me? I want to know where I'm going, all right? Uh, so uh, first thing first, I'd say try to identify the conclusion. Um, that's going to be typically the easiest thing to do. Not only will it be the easiest, it is going to affect how you interpret the rest of the argument. So with this in mind, let's just do a few examples uh, for practice. So read this really quickly and see if you can figure out what the argument is. You may have to pause the video lecture if you do, that's fine. Um, just try to figure out what the argument, what the, not the argument, I'm sorry, what the conclusion is. And hopefully you were able to discover that the conclusion is actually the very first sentence uh, of this. Cutting the interest rate will have no effect on the stock market this time around. Um, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but notice here we had this indicator word, as. And you may recall, as is a premise indicator word. So we know what's coming after as is going to be a premise people have been expecting. That's a premise. So it's saying cutting the interest rate will have no effect this, on the stock market this time around because you know, people have been expecting this uh, rate cut all along. So we know that the, the first part of this first sentence is what they're trying to establish. It is their conclusion. And this is a good lesson here because conclusions don't always come at the end. Conclusions can come first. Conclusions can come in the middle. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes they don't even state them. That's, that's kind of obnoxious when that occurs. But uh, don't necessarily think, oh, it's the conclusion. It has to be at the end. Totally not true. Let's do another example. Now, I want you to pause the video lecture um, because this is kind of lengthy and try to figure out what is the conclusion. But this one's a little tricky. Uh, there's a lot of wording going on here. And sometimes I have students, they say, oh, the conclusion is most city uh, governments no longer possess the budgets. Uh, oh, sorry, I lost my wording there. Most, unfortunately, most city governments no longer possess the budgets or the tax base to fully support their social, social infrastructures. Um, unfortunately is not, unfortunately, an indicator word. Um, that's just, I don't know, that's a kind of a performative word. It just, you know, it's just, just thrown in there for stylistic reasons. There is, however, an indicator word we see in all of this, and it occurs at the very last line, thus. 
Proper urban planning and design thus require a federal commitment. And this whole last sentence, that is the conclusion of this. So, again, uh, scroll through, skim through, look for indicator words. You don't always see them, but that is a good um, way to check, figure out what the conclusion is. So, we want to identify the conclusion. Like I said, this is, I'd say, start here. Sometimes you won't see uh, the conclusion, it won't be evident, but always say, all right, well, first thing, I've identified this argument. Second, let me look for the conclusion. Um, now, let me throw a few curveballs at you, because when it comes to identifying conclusions, and we've seen this occur already, is that sometimes you have what we call extended arguments that have multiple conclusions. Uh, actually, you can have arguments that have multiple conclusions in different ways, but I want to focus on what we call an extended argument. And an extended argument is one in which the person argues for a conclusion, but then uses that conclusion in order to extend the argument and lead to another conclusion. Uh, you know, I've, I've said this already, but you probably encounter someone, they'll say something like, well, I argued for X in order to show you that Y is true. And in that, we have an extended argument. And what comes at the very, very end, we call the main conclusion. Little bitty arguments, like the first, is, you know, I said, I want to establish X in order to show you why. While they're arguing for X, that's called a sub-argument. A sub-argument is an argument that is, is, exists within a larger argument. And let me give you an example of this so you can see what I'm talking about and be clear on the terminology. Read through this very briefly and see if you can identify the arguments. Language is necessary for communication, and communication is necessary for advancement. Therefore, language is necessary for advancement. Any attempt to censor language could restrict advancement. This is why the censorship of books is always wrong. Now, look at this. Do you see any indicator words present here? And hopefully you see two. I imagine everybody sees therefore, but look, this is why. That is an indicator phrase and lets you know that there is a conclusion. So we have two conclusions going on here. Now, I'm going to just list this argument in step-by-step -step premise conclusion form so you can see it. But here, uh, well, we got my numbers, skip that. Uh, but you can see it right here, uh, that we have this lengthy argument. And hopefully you recognize that this part right here, one and two, these lead to three. And then three becomes a premise that leads to five down here. And what we have is this is an argument. Notice this is an argument as well, three, four, and five. And both of these are sub-arguments. This would be what we call sub-argument one, one, two, and three. Sub-argument two is three, four, and five. And then one through five, this is the main argument. So if you were to say, well, how many arguments are going on here? Well, technically three. There's one to three, there's three to five, and there's one to five. So I don't think that's particularly complicated, but it's just important that you're clear on the terminology. When I start talking about a sub-argument, I mean an argument that is a smaller argument contained within a main argument. And you could have, in theory, you could have, I don't know, an infinite number of sub-arguments. Uh, you know, you could have, uh, I don't know what you'd call it at that point, like sub-sub argument. I don't know if there's terminology for that or not. But, um, I mean, you could have, you know, for instance, uh, an argument that's used to support one. And then one becomes, um, uh, you know, part of this argument right here from one to three. I mean, you could have as many sub-arguments as are needed. But uh, I, I do want you to be able to see how within this larger argument of 1 to 5, we, can, we have these separate arguments that are occurring, these sub-arguments. So there's one final thing I want to talk about with, with regard to identifying conclusion, and I've kind of danced around this a little bit. I said that typically people making arguments, they want to advertise their conclusion. You know, that's, that's what they're trying to sell you on, so they want to be pretty straightforward about that. But this is not always the case, and this can be really downright obnoxious sometimes. Uh, where a person is making an argument, they seem to be implying something, uh, but they never come out and explicitly state it. And when this occurs, when a person is making an argument, but they don't outright state their conclusion, we have what we call here an implied conclusion. 
an implied conclusion. And when this occurs, we have to do a little bit of detective work and figure out what exactly are they saying. Uh, and, and as far as this goes, when someone doesn't explicitly state their conclusion, a lot of times it could be a lot of different things. Uh, you know, uh, certain evidence could actually support various conclusions. So we, we have to be careful here because we, once we get into the realm of identifying implied conclusions, we are, in effect, putting words into someone's mouth. I mean, that's really what we're doing. Um, we're saying, all right, well, you're arguing for something. I don't, you haven't really told me what it is, but I think this is what you're trying to say. So I want to give you an example, and I want you to read through this and pause uh, this and try to figure out what exactly is the conclusion that they're trying to reach here. So you read when you read through this, you see that I'll just read it for you or read it to you. And it says humans are the only uh, creatures which systematically kill their own species. And some of you are like, what? What does systematically kill? Uh, systematically kill just means like methodically with a plan. In a word, genocide. All right, humans are the only species which which uh, perform genocide. You don't see dogs, for instance, trying to completely eradicate other types of dogs simply because their fur is a different color or they enjoy playing fetch as opposed to chasing cars. And you probably picked up and you're like, well, the, the, you know, the fur thing, that seems to be a parallel for racism. Enjoy playing fetch as opposed to chasing cars. It seems to, you know, systematically killing people because of, you know, I don't know, their activities or things they do. Maybe that could be, uh, you know, perceived as, you know, belief systems or whatever. Um, so humans are the only species which kill you know, for reasons, or systematically kill for reasons of race, or a creed, or ideology. Other animals don't do that. Um, now, are they just telling us this? Is this just a mere description? They just said, oh, humans are the only ones that do this. The end. Um, it seems like they're implying something here. What exactly are they implying? Well, they don't say it, so we have to do, you know, use a little bit of creative license here and figure out, what are you saying? What are you implying? And it could be different things. I remember I had a student one year say, uh, I said, what does this imply? And she said, humans suck. Um, the truth is, is maybe, you know, they didn't tell us um, their conclusion. They didn't tell us where the, this was supposed to lead to. Humans suck. I don't know. Maybe. That's, that's at least a possibility. Um, I think maybe something a little, um, a little uh, I don't know, less negative but I think what they're saying is something like the following. It is wrong to systematically kill one's own species. Uh, or in other words, genocide is wrong. Uh, you might just summarize it like that. To systematically kill is just to perform genocide. Now, notice when you read up here at the top, it never uses the word wrong. Um, and I don't think, let me just double check. No, it never says it's wrong. It just says we're the only ones that do this. Animals don't do this. Animals don't kill for this reason. Animals don't kill for that reason but it seems to be implying there's something defective about doing this. We're the only ones to do it. None of the other ones do it. And, and so since we're alone in this, we're doing something wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. So this seems to be the implied conclusion of this argument here. They never state it. They just indicate it. They imply it. Look, I want to do another one. And I want you to pause the video lecture and read this here and see if you can figure out what is the implied conclusion. So go ahead and pause the video lecture and, and try to figure out what, is the, what are they trying to convince you of? Now, you might say, uh, so hopefully you did that, and you, you might say, well, um, I don't know, there are different things that people sometimes indicate here. Uh, but I think once I, it, I point out what the implied conclusion is, you're going to say, oh, yeah, that is what they're trying to sell us on. It's not, it's not immediately obvious. Uh, it's not immediately obvious. But I think what they're trying to imply here is basically the welfare state will not work. Now, if you read through this, there's nowhere here where they just flat out say the welfare state won't work. You know, they talk about the welfare state rests on the ideal that man is unselfish. And then it says it's futile to run a, a society on the principle of unselfishness. Um, and then it gives reasons to think that people are selfish. 
Um, and then it reiterates, you know, no society that presupposes unselfish instincts can work, which this last sentence is actually a reiteration of the second sentence. It's futile to run a society on this principle, that being unselfishness. This is just a reiteration of that. But nowhere does it actually say the welfare state won't work. But that's what they're implying. That's what the implied conclusion of this argument is. So, you know, I said this earlier, is that when we're trying to distill arguments, it's not always this nice, neat, you know, step-by-step -step procedure. You know, said, you know, that's the way, you know, we naturally will proceed, and it's easy to explain the process of distilling arguments in this, you know, nice, neat, you know, step-by-step -step fashion. But sometimes we start reading an argument, and you're like, wait, I can't figure out what the conclusion here is. And then you have to start looking at the premises in order to figure out the conclusion. So um, that typically occurs when the, the author doesn't explicitly state their conclusion. So do be on the lookout for implied conclusions. Uh, you actually are probably quite familiar with this, even if you never heard the terminology implied conclusion. You do know that sometimes people, they'll, they'll make an argument and you'll get done. And you're like, so what exactly are you saying? Yeah, and when you, when you ask that question, so what exactly are you saying? You're not, you know, implying, I didn't understand what you were saying. Rather, you're saying, rather you're asking, what exactly conclusion are you trying to draw from this, All right? And when you're asking that question, what conclusion are you trying to draw, you're pointing out they never explicitly stated their conclusion. Their conclusion is at best implied. All right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about trying to figure out conclusions and identifying implied conclusions. Well, how, do, how exactly do we diagram implied conclusions? And I'm going to just kind of go through this really quickly, but um, look at this argument here, and let's see if we can figure out what the premises are and the conclusion is. As I said, the, well, I already told you what the conclusion is, is implied, but what, is the, what are the premises in this argument? And as it turns out, there's really only one premise in this argument. Humans are the only creatures which systematically kill their own species. Notice all of this stuff right here. You don't see dogs, you know, that sort of thing. That's just examples of number one. We don't really need any of that when we're trying to actually, you know, distill the argument. Um, you know, dogs killing because of fur, people, you know, joy playing fetch or changing stories. Those are just examples to help clarify. So if we were to summarize this argument, it would just be one, premise one, humans are the only creatures who systematically kill their own species. Conclusion, it is wrong to systematically kill one's own species. Um, so how do we diagram this? Well, uh, here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. When you have an implied conclusion, what I want you to do is draw one or you know, list the premises down to two and then write a lowercase c. And the reason for that is because if you don't have the C there, if it was just one down arrow two, uh, if you're looking at the diagram, you would think that two had been explicitly stated. But by writing that lowercase c out beside the two, that lets whoever's looking at the diagram know, oh, this was implied. This wasn't actually stated. So this is going to be much more informative if we do the one down arrow two with the lowercase c. We only do the C, however, when the conclusion is implied. If, if let's say the person, you know, up here in, the, in, the, um, in this paragraph, if they had written, it is, so it is wrong to systematically kill their own, your own species, we wouldn't have to put this C here. We just do one down arrow two. But when the conclusion is implied, we need a way of showing that in the diagram that it has been implied. So that's how we diagram an implied conclusion. All right, step number three, uh, identifying the premises. As I said, you know, typically the way you work through a, an argument when you're trying to distill it is you first go with the conclusion. Well, that's, I would say, most of the time the easier task. The more difficult task is identifying premises, um, and we'll see why that is, but part of the reason is just even though there are indicator words, they're not always used. So I want you to, oh, sorry, I went a little too quickly. Not only are they not always used, but when it comes to the premises, the second problem, and this is a pretty big one, is there's almost always more information than you actually need. And it's easy to confuse the information you do need with the information you don't need. 
Uh, you, and the information you don't need are basically examples or, you know, sometimes authors will repeat points. And it's like, wait, you said that already. You, that's, that's not a new premise. That's just the same premise being repeated. Or maybe they'll repeat a point using different language. Like I said, they'll use examples. They'll offer various data. They'll have um, words that are in there for just uh, transition purposes that really aren't absolutely essential. So let's look at this example and see if you can identify what the premises are. And remember, we're trying to get rid of examples. We're trying to get rid of unnecessary information and see if we can identify just the premises. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do that. So as far as identifying the premises go, there are only two uh, in this argument. And hopefully you saw that the first one is to attract new residents, city centers need to provide the amenities that suburbs and edge cities advertise. And then the second one is, unfortunately, most city governments no longer possess the budgets or the tax bases to fully support their social infrastructures. But then also I hope you realize that there's some unnecessary information here. And the unnecessary information is what I've crossed out. So the first sentence, the first premise, to attract new residents, city centers need to provide the amenities that suburbs and edge cities advertise. Notice that everything that comes after it, affordable housing, high quality education, daycare, after school programs, those are just examples. Um, those are just examples of these amenities. So we, when we're distilling the argument, we don't need to mention those. Um, then we come down, unfortunately, well, that's just a transition term. Uh, I mean, you could have deleted that. It would have made no difference to the argument whatsoever. Um, that's just something of the person saying this put in there for stylistic reasons. So the argument, if we were just to distill it down to its bare bone you know, points, it's premise one, to attract new residents, city centers need to provide the amenities that suburbs and edge cities advertise. Premise two, most city governments no longer possess the budgets or tax bases to fully support their infrastructure. Conclusion, therefore proper urban planning and design require a federal commitment. And that's the argument broken down to its bare bones. We got rid of a lot of information there. So you guys hopefully have a sense of how we do that, uh, how we delete information that's not necessary. We're going to be practicing that more and more. Um, but what I want to turn to now is a problem that was very similar to one we were talking about a second ago, um, the problem of implied conclusions. That The problem of implied conclusions actually occurs a whole lot less than what we're about to discuss, which is the problem of implicit premises. Um, most of the time people want to tell you their conclusions, but what happens a lot, in fact, I would guess every argument. Um, there is uh, some premise that's being used in the argument that's not explicitly say I shouldn't have said every, but a lot of arguments that are presented just in natural, uh, in the real world, and you read a newspaper article or something like that, there's almost always going to be some assumption that the argument is making that's not explicitly stated. And whenever this occurs, what we have going on is we have what we call an implicit premise. Um, which is a premise, you know, as I say up here, that is assumed by the argument but not stated. Sometimes we'll call these unstated premises. Sometimes people will call them assumptions. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say unstated assumption, which is a bit redundant because if it's an assumption, then it's unstated. But um, basically, uh, this is just a phenomenon that occurs when a person um, is constructing an argument, but they leave something out that is vital for establishing the, the conclusion. And you probably are familiar with this, maybe this language, maybe not as familiar with the language, but you ever had been in an argument with someone or been listening to someone and you're like, wait, how did you get from A to B? It's like, it seems like there was a step missing in your logic. You just moved very abruptly. You went from, you know, one and two to four, but how, there's something missing there. Um, whenever that occurs, um, chances are it's because there's something that the person is assuming but they're not telling you. And I want to give you a few examples so you can see this. But read this argument right here. Sally broke her leg, therefore Sally can't go hiking. Sally broke her leg, therefore Sally can't go hiking. Does it seem like any kind of uh, jump in logic here? And you might be thinking, no, not really. If you've broken leg, you know, how are you going to go hiking? But if you said that, you actually already supplied what is missing here. This argument is making an assumption, and the assumption is something like the following. People with broken legs can't go hiking. Now, 
I know that that might be so obvious it's not worth stating, but it it is an assumption of this argument. Um, it's it's it, because the first premise is talking about her breaking her leg, but the conclusion is talking about you know it's not even talking about legs. It's talking about hiking, and it's talking about your ability to go hiking. So the premise is actually dealing with different concepts than the conclusion is. And what this argument is assuming is that people with broken legs can't go hiking. Now I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but um, there's a problem that exists here, and it's very similar to what we're talking about with implied conclusions. Is because the person is assuming something um, and they're not stating it, we have the ability to supplement or substitute any number of possible assumptions that might work here. I'll talk about this more in a moment, but um, you know, I say people with broken legs cannot go hiking is the assumption that this argument is making. But it's actually possible that there are a number of different assumptions that, that they could be making in order to get from one to three. Um, but just put that on the, on the back burner for right now. Read this argument right here and see if you can figure out what's missing. Some students are failing French, so those students must not like French. Notice that the first premise is talking about something that the conclusion isn't. This is talking about, in premise one, failing French. Do you see failing down here? No, this is talking about liking French. So how do you get from failing French to not liking French? What is this argument assuming? Uh, because it's like, oh, people are failing French, so they must not like French. Well, what is the assumption? Well, it seems like something like the following. Students fail subjects they do not like. And notice how this right here, it basically provides a bridge from one to three. It provides a way of connecting one to three um, because this is connecting failing with dislike. And, and by doing that, it pro provides us a way to logically conclude three on the basis of one. If we go back two slides to just this, it's like, wait, this seems, uh, you know, just a jump in logic. You're talking about, you know, students' performance to the dislike of a subject. I, I mean, how do you get from performance to dislike? Um, you have to find some kind of, you might say, bridge principle to connect uh, this concept here, failing with the concept of dislike. And that's precisely what this does. This explicitly connects failing to not liking and therefore provides us a bridge from one to three. Now there's a whole lot to be said about implicit premises, um, but I want to talk about two important rules for identifying implicit premises. And the first one I was just uh, indicating a little bit, but when we identify implicit premises, um, the whole point of this is to close the logical gap between the stated premise and the conclusion. Um, as I said, you know, when we're looking for a, uh, implicit premises, it, it is most often when someone has argued and you're like, wait, how did you get from one to three? It seems like, or how, one from two, it seems like there was a jump in your way of thinking here. Um, and when you've, you experience that, that sense of there was a jump in your thinking, that means there's a logical gap. And look back at this argument and notice here um, we have to close that logical gap. And as I was saying earlier, sorry, these animations are kind of pitiful. I had to draw this by freehand, and I'm not I'm really skilled at that. But the, the first premise is talking about a broken leg, and the conclusion is talking about cannot go hiking. So we need something to connect breaking a leg with the inability to go hiking. There are two different concepts right here. Um, actually, the, truthfully, there are three concepts. There's Sally, you might say. There's, I should say three terms. There's Sally, but Sally occurs down here, so there was, we don't need a bridge principle to connect Sally to Sally because you know that's just fine. But broken leg to not go in hiking, we need something to connect those two. We need something that's going to close this logical gap, so to speak. Um, and so that's number one. We, whatever assumption we identify, it has to perform that role. Secondly, um, I was saying this a little bit earlier, but when we're trying to close this logical gap, we're trying to build this bridge from one to two, there are almost always going to be a number of different ways we can do this. And we have to be careful um, here because we are, you know, I was saying this earlier with conclusions, but we're doing it here. We're putting words into someone's mouth. We're saying, hey, what you're assuming is X. And when we do that, we're, we're basically trying to figure out what, what was going on in their thinking. And we're, you know, 
um, you know, vocalizing, I just kept saying visualizing, vocalizing um, what it is they're thinking. So we are putting words into their mouth, but we need to be careful not to put too many words into the person's mouth, or rather we should put words in their mouth that they're willing to accept, all right? So I want to share with you something. Look at this argument. Um, you know, I said this is the implicit premise. People with broken legs cannot go hiking. And this does effectively close this logical gap from talking about breaking a leg to not going hiking. But this isn't the only possible um, uh, assumption here. Here's an other, another possibility. It is impossible for people with broken legs to go hiking. Notice that this, it closes the logical gap. You know, it... it combines breaking legs with an inability to go hiking, but it says it's impossible. That's a really strong thing to say. Here's another one. People with broken legs usually cannot go hiking. Notice that this right here, this connects broken, leg, broken legs with an inability to go hiking, but it's weaker than, than this one up here. I mean, it's one thing to say it's impossible. Another thing to say you usually can't do it, right? And this would be a case in point. I, I hope that this isn't like oversimplistic for any of you, but you know, if we were choosing between A and B as what the assumption is, B seems like a better one because you know A would really overly commit the person. This would be committing the person to an extremely strong principle here. You know, it's like, well, you know, if I was saying, well, look, you you are saying, if I if I let's say a person was making this argument to me, and I said back to them. And I said, well, what you're assuming is that it's impossible for people with broken legs to go hiking. You know, the person might kind of get a little annoyed with that and say, no, I'm not assuming that. I'm just assuming that usually they can't, right? Uh, and, and so you can see here, we want to be careful. We, we are putting words in the people's mouth, but we don't want to put, you know, too many words in their mouth or put words in their mouth that they couldn't accept. We want to put words in their mouth that they'll be like, yeah, okay, I agree. That seems reasonable. I want to point out here while we're on the subject, there are actually a lot of other possible assumptions. One, they might be saying people with broken legs never go hiking. Now, you might be like, what, what, what's the difference between A and C? Well, here's the difference. I mean, it's one thing to say something is impossible. It's another thing, and it's a different thing to say that it never happens. Um, you know, imagine going back to the time before the Wright brothers flew the first plane. You know, someone might have said, people did say, flight is impossible. Well, that's different than saying no one has ever flown a plane before, right? To say it's impossible, you're making a, a statement about human capability and the limitations on human capability. To say that it's never happened is just to merely describe the history of the world up to that point. You know, if I say, you know, no one's ever gone to Mars before, that's not to say it's impossible. It's just to say it hasn't at this point happened. So C is actually weaker than A. Um, and it's another possibility. Here's a, a fourth one. Actually, it's a fifth one. Uh, people with broken legs usually do not go. And see, D is actually different than C because I'm not saying it's never occurred. I'm just saying it typically doesn't. D is also different than B because it's different from saying usually cannot to usually do not. Um, so I'm pointing all this out because when we go get into the business of identifying assumptions, uh, you know, they're almost always, I don't know, I want to say an infinite number of possibilities, but there are a lot of possibilities. Um, and those possibilities exist because since the person or arguer didn't tell us explicitly how they arrived, went from A or 1 to 3, we have to guess. We have to do detective work. And so we want to be very careful here that we don't put too many words in their mouth or we don't put words in their mouth they're not willing to accept. Let's do a few more examples just so you can see this. Um, so some students are failing French, uh, so those students must not like French. And I said, well, here's a case in point, uh, you know, maybe what they're assuming is students uh, fail subjects they do not like. But this isn't the only possibility. There are other possibilities here as well. Um, it might be students always fail subjects they do not like. You know, that, notice that would build the bridge from one to three. That's a really strong thing to say. Maybe instead, students usually fail subjects they do not like. And again, just like the previous argument, B is a weaker claim than A. So if you said, you know, somebody, let's say somebody was making this argument to you, and they're like, well, st some students are failing French, so they must not like French. And you said back to them, well, you're assuming that students always fail subjects they don't like. You would be attributing to the person making that argument a very strong claim. 
uh, and it's probably an assumption that most people wouldn't be willing to accept because the truth is, is A, down here just seems false. I mean, I've taken many subjects I didn't like. Probably you guys are taking one right now in logic. Um, but taking many subjects I didn't like, and I still passed it. So uh, you need to be careful here that you don't overly commit the person. Right, here's another possibility. Students cannot pass subjects they do not like. You know, that's, that's a strong claim too. And notice C is different than A. A is actually merely a descriptive claim about what students always do. This is a claim about, uh, again, it's a limitation on human capabilities. They can't do it. They can't. It, it's, it's basically saying it's impossible to pass a subject you don't like. Um, so, sorry, I clicked too quickly. Uh, the point I'm making here is, and the reason I'm listing A, B, and C, is to show you there's a range of possible assumptions um, when we're trying to identify those. And we need to be careful that we don't overly commit um, the person whose argument we're looking at. We don't overly commit them when we identify the implicit premise. Okay, so let's look at one more example. Uh, read the following argument. You don't see animals murdering one another. Therefore, it is wrong for humans to commit murder. I want you to think about this for a second and ask, do you see any kind of jump in logic represented here? And some of you probably do see that there are a couple of concepts that are, appear in the uh, premise that don't appear in the conclusion. There seems to be something fishy going on here where they're jumping from talking about animals to talking about humans. So what is this argument assuming? What is the bridge principle that gets us from one to two? What is the implicit premise? Well, I want to point out that probably a lot of you saw that one of the concepts being discussed in the premise is that they're talking about animals whereas in the conclusion they're talking about humans. So whatever it is the, the implicit premise is, it's going to have to say something that's going to connect animals to humans. But there's another difference in concepts and this one is really subtle and some of you may not have seen this and for those who did, congratulations, but notice that in the premise it's talking about don't. Um, it's, descri it's merely describing animals' behavior, saying you don't see, or in other words, animals don't murder one another. And then the conclusion is talking about it being wrong to do so. Uh, and these are very different. You know, it's one thing to say uh, I don't know, people don't, I don't know, wear white pants after Labor Day. It's another thing entirely to say it is wrong to wear white pants after Labor Day. Uh, it's one thing to say... I don't know, you, people don't wear pink with red. It's another thing to say it is wrong to wear pink with red. Uh, so you, you have to see that there's a logical jump here. You should see not only between animals to humans, but between describing behavior, which is really what one is doing, is describing behavior to prescribing uh, behavior and the conclusion. Uh, there's a difference between saying how something is between and saying how something should or ought to be. So whatever it is the implicit premise or the assumption going on here, we're going to have to connect animal behavior to human behavior. We're also going to have to connect the concept of describing with the concept of prescribing or saying something is wrong. And like before, there are different ways we can go, but one possibility here is to say something like this. Human behavior should be like animal behavior. Notice that this accomplishes our goals because it, it discusses human behavior at the very beginning of the, the assumption here. See, it says human behavior, then it says animal behavior down here, thus connecting um, animal to human down here. And it also says human behavior should be like animal behavior, thus connecting the, the description up here down with the wrongness of, it, uh, of human behavior, or hu I should say murder, down here. And this would do um, an, uh, an acceptable job. That's not the right word I want to do. This would, this would perform the job that we're setting out to do right here of connecting one to three. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. This does build the bridge from one to three. It gets us from one to three logically, so it logically closes that gap. But does this seem a good way of building that bridge? Think about this. Human behavior should be like animal behavior. Does that seem true at all? And the answer to that question, I hope, is obviously no.
Um, why, why should human behavior be like animal behavior? That just seems emphatically wrong. I mean, think about that for a second. You know, when dogs greet one another, they go around sniffing each other's butts. Um, is that how we should greet each other? Now, what you do in the privacy of your own home, you know, that's your, that's your own business. But, you know, for me, I'm not interested in that. Um, you know, there's no, uh, this, to say human behavior should be like animal behavior just seems decidedly wrong. So the point I'm making here is that while one, two, three does build that bridge, you know, uh, I'm sorry, while two does build that bridge from one to three, it, it builds a bridge that basically collapses as soon as we take a step onto it. It's like it builds a bridge out of toothpicks uh, and glue. And it's like once you try to walk on it, it's just going to crumble under your feet. So uh, we this is another important lesson. You have to be careful because when it comes to supplying these implicit premises, while some of them will work to the degree that they close that logical gap, they, they close that logical gap at the expense of saying something that's just false. And you need to be careful about that. Well, here's another possibility of a way we could close this logical gap. Maybe you could say something like this. You don't see animals murdering one another. Therefore, murder is unnatural. If an action is unnatural, then it's wrong. Therefore, it is wrong for humans to commit murder. And this right here, it closes that logical gap from one to three, just like um, the previous one also closed that logical gap. Uh, notice here, there's a couple things I want to point out, but one is, in, in closing the logical gap in this um, instance, we didn't just come up with one implicit premise. We actually came up with two, um, two and three. And this is something you sometimes have to do. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to reconstruct an argument, it's not just one assumption the argument's making. I mean, a lot of times arguments will make a, a myriad of different assumptions. Um, the only ones you really you know, pinpoint or, or finger out as you say, well, the ones that are important for, you know, typically showing the argument's fault. Those are typically the assumptions you want to highlight. But uh, you sometimes do, in order to um, reconstruct an argument, have to identify multiple assumptions in order to piece it together in a nice, neat, logical way. Now, this one, it closes the logical gap. Um, we need to stop here and ask, does, it, does this um, way of doing it work any better than the previous um, way? And I think the answer to that is going to also be no. If you if you look at this right here, you know, you, you mean you could raise all sorts of questions for premise two. It's like murder is unnatural. Is, is it actually unnatural? I mean, people seem to you know do it all throughout human history, but let's leave that to the side and, and ask the you know question, it, if an action is unnatural, is it wrong? And that doesn't seem right either. I mean, you know, we fly in planes, you know, people have pacemakers, people have artificial limbs, you know. None of these things are natural. In fact, you know, the very word, artificial limb, you know, it's artificial, it's not natural. Um, but are these things wrong? Is it wrong to have an artificial limb? No. I mean, if, if you know, I lost an arm, I'd definitely want to get an artificial limb. Uh, you know, if um, you fly in a plane, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. So the, the problem here we see is actually the same problem that affected the first attempt to, to close this logical gap is there are ways of doing it of closing that logical gap, but they come at the expense of saying something that is wrong. And this highlights the, the another important lesson is it's not always possible to close the logical gaps that exist in arguments. Um, and in fact, this argument right here, um, you don't see animals murdering one another, therefore it is wrong for humans to commit murder. This argument doesn't work at all. It's never going to work. Um, this is actually guilty of what we call is a fallacy, and a fallacy is just kind of any general mistake in reasoning, um, but it's a fallacy, it's a well-identified fallacy called the is-ought fallacy, is, I-S, space, O-U-G-H-T, uh, and is refers to, you know, describing, ought refers to like should, should not, the way things ought to be. Um, and this is a, a mistake of moving from describing how something is and then based on that description, concluding how things should be. Um, and, and it's just not a, 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 I'm trying to think, a sound way to reason. It is a logical fallacy. It is what we call a non sequitur. The conclusion just does not follow from the premise. Uh, this was a fallacy identified by David Hume, actually, is an um, Enlightenment philosopher. And he identified this centuries ago. 
uh, the is ought fallacy. And you actually see forms of this fallacy occur uh, regularly. You don't have to remember any of this. I'm just telling you all this about the is ought fallacy for your own benefit. But um, one common example of this, and I hopefully don't step on any toes here, but you'll hear people say something like this, the following. The United States is the only um, industrialized nation that doesn't have universal health care. Therefore, the United States should have universal health care. Now, stated as such, that is is ought fallacy, just you know, writ large, because you're saying uh, you're describing what other countries do, and then based on that, you're saying how you know the United States should act. Um, you're moving from a description of how things are to a prescription of how things should be, and that is a fallacy. Now, there are ways you might be able to reconstruct that argument, you know, to change you know what is being said, but you know, I have heard it presented just like that, and to the degree that it is. That's a fallacy of reasoning. So I just throw that out there for your own benefit. What we're focusing on is identifying implicit premises. And the lesson I've been saying is sometimes, you know, it's not just one that you have to identify. It's multiple um, premises that have not been stated. And sometimes, and this is worth pointing out, is you can't always close that logical gap. And the third thing is sometimes you can close it, but at the expense of saying something false. And when that occurs, you need to search around and see if you can find one uh, an implicit premise that isn't false, because that would be putting words into a person's mouth that they wouldn't accept. All right, so now that we've talked about identifying implicit premises, I want to just round out this video lecture talking about uh, how we diagram them. And there are different ways we could diagram them. And you might look at something like this and say, well, I know how to diagram that. It just, you know, one plus two down to three. Uh, um, and that is possible, and this isn't so much wrong as it is just uninformative. You know, when we talked about uh, diagramming implicit conclusions, I told you to use lowercase c. Well, as you might guess, what I'm going to suggest is that we use lowercase a, that we don't do something like that. Because 1 plus 2 down to 3 is not, like I said, wrong, it's just uninformative. Now, if you do the reading in the book, as I suggested, the book actually says to do something different. It says to do something like the following, um, that you would do, you would use A, like lowercase a. And the book actually, if you look at some of the answers to some of the practice, um, it'll just use different letters for each assumption. So if you had an argument that had two assumptions, you know, the first one would be A, the second one would be B, and then it just, you know, would have you do something like this. And this would work. The only problem is is one lesson later, the book just abandons this. So I don't know why they teach you to use lowercase letters for assumptions only to abandon it like one, you know, not even a chapter, like a page later. Um, so we're not going to use that just because it would be, I think, frivolous and superfluous to learn one thing just to abandon it. What we're going to do is, you know, much like um, what we did with conclusions is we'll just use the numbers that we use when we um, write them out beside the assumption and then use a lowercase a to identify in the diagram that this was an assumption. This was something that wasn't explicitly said by the author. Uh, and for every assumption we're just going to use, if, if like we have multiple assumptions, we'll just use lowercase a for each one of them. So for instance, like this one right here, we're just going to do you know, 1 leads down to 2, 2 plus 3, a, uh, leads down to 2a, 2 plus 3a leads down to 4. Um, and it's just, that's how we'll, we'll do it. And notice that we can see right here that uh, the a indicates that these are assumptions. These were not explicitly stated. So it's providing us a little bit more information than if we just use numbers. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait, look, isn't 2 also an implied conclusion here? Because, you know, we're concluding 2 from 1. It is, but we don't need to list a C because the down arrow indicates that 2 is a conclusion. So if we put a C here, um, you know, um, we don't need to, to put that because we know it's a conclusion and the A indicates that it wasn't explicitly stated. So um, we don't need to, to also introduce a C because the A is doing the job of telling us that, oh, this wasn't explicitly stated and the down arrow is doing a job of letting us know that this was a conclusion that was reached. So when it comes to diagramming implicit premises, just remember, we, it's like the same diagrams as before. The only difference is we add a lowercase a uh, to indicate that it was assumed and not explicitly stated. Now, here's your homework assignment for next class. And what I want you to do is I want you to do a little bit more than just what the instructions say. The instructions for these said just identify the implicit premise.
But I also want you to diagram um, the implicit premise as well, um, or to diagram the argument uh, along with the implicit premise. 